Hello, Vanessa. Hello, Brad. How nice are you? you? Oh, good. You let me in. My colleague, Sean. He's going to so be running the slides. So. We'll give both of you co host privileges if you would like. Hi, Brad. Hello. Welcome. Hi, Sean. Thank you. Hi, Vanessa. Do we have any sense of numbers today? I don't know. Whatever that. shows up. Okay, cool. Yeah. The last one Five I was or 3, about 40, so that was a pretty decent size. So yeah. Sure. I'll try the devices. So this one, Vanessa's just slides, no video in this one. So okay. it should be pretty straightforward. Just in there. Vanessa, how do I say your last name? And is it Sion? It's and it's Sean, but I'll I'll be kind of behind the scenes. So. Okay, I, I don't want to completely butcher your names if I <laughs> if I don't have to. So if you just think Labor Day, but you say Le, you'll be fine. Okay. So like Labor Day. Labor Day. Okay. Yeah. Close enough. You know, it's just the easiest one to remember. I think. I will give that a shot and I apologize ahead of time if no worries. Doesn't go well. <laughs> I'm gonna bet I'm about to butcher a land acknowledgement. So <laughs> and as always, I wish I just knew how to pronounce them. Yeah. <laughs> ah, I know how to say stolo. Okay. Although I, I don't know if that's right. <laughs> Are we ready to go? Yeah, I think we should get started here. So hello everyone. My name is Brad Breakright. So I'm the moderator for this uh, session. And uh, if you have any technical issues or anything, please just uh, send me a private message and I'll see if I can help you out. Um, I'd like to, uh, first of all, welcome and everyone to the room and introduce everyone to Vanessa uh, Liberday, I believe it is pretty close to that anyway, so sorry about that if I did butcher that. And uh, our uh, session on transformational Zooming. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Vanessa, go ahead. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. And I'm very glad you're here. And I'm excited to talk about what I call transformational zooming, which is uh, a way of transcending the digital medium and creating change makers and transformational change in the in learners, um, despite the little boxes that we live in. So hopefully you'll have a little bit of an experience of that today. And, uh, but before I start, uh, or as my start, I, I would like to acknowledge the land that I am on. And whenever I do that, I, I really try to feel the actual ground that I'm on and not just name a name in my head, but like actually feel the land of the, uh, it's quite a number of nations, the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Kakait, Coquitlam and uh, Musqueam nations all shared this land for centuries and centuries and centuries. And uh, I'm grateful for the care of it. So if you can, as some have already started, if you know the, na the names of the nations whose land you're on, if you could write it in the chat. Um, a lot of people are doing really well with the spelling I see, and uh, but I know you could try anyway. I think trying is better than, than not. So I, uh, my name is Vanessa Laborde. I'm the executive director of Dream Rider Productions. We're a nonprofit based in BC. And we started as a theater company. I started as a musical theater performer. Uh, we also started as a project of the city of Vancouver doing environmental plays for kids in schools. And this is, these pictures now kind of terrify me in COVID, but <laughs> we, uh, reached over a million kids with our live shows. And so a lot of what I've developed has been day after day, I toured for 10 years doing shows and seeing what worked and didn't work with children and how to engage them in learning about environmental issues. And um, about 10 years ago, we started realizing that our shows, which were very funny, silly plays for elementary schools, I should say, on themes like climate, waste and water, um, 
we, they were really affecting kids. They were, kids were going home and changing their families, even though we hadn't asked them to. So about 10 years ago, we thought, wow, this really needs to scale and theater isn't very scalable. So how can we use digital media to actually reach more children across Canada? And the first thing we did was made videos, but kids watch videos like they're zombies. And we thought, you know, in our live shows, kids are like singing and yelling and pointing at the supervillain and laughing. And we felt that that embodiment was part of the transformational effect that happened that made kids go home and change their families. So we thought, how can we use digital media to create that same kind of audience reaction, theatrical reaction in kids? And we spent about two years in classrooms with teachers and kids and parents trying to figure that question out. And so a lot of what I'm going to tell you today is, is rooted in that. Um, and we started with, in our work with the city of Vancouver, we work with, um, to, you know, reduce transit use or things like that with very, very environmental outcomes. But we realize that at heart, what our work is, is we create change makers or we help inspire kids to be change makers. And that was part of a process of me becoming an Ashoka fellow, which is a global recognition that of uh, people who are helping other people to be change makers, basically. They were like, you are making change makers. So here we are. So I'd like to actually to start with um, another uh, thing for you guys to put in chat. I'd like you to think about what is your superpower? So we talked to kids about their superpower. We have this beautiful video from a uh, Dine woman named Pat McCabe, uh, Woman Stands Shining. And she says that all of us are born with our superpower or as in, in as they call it, indigenous uh, uh, ways of thinking um, in your medicine. So for me, my one of my superpowers is singing, writing songs that stick in your head. So some people it's kindness, some people don't know what their superpower is, that's fine. It can be in development. But if you have a thought of what your superpower is, let's, let's see it in the chat. Um, and if you have a little piece of paper, I would love you to draw your superhero. So uh, yourself as a superhero, because one of the things that we do that we've learned to do is to use art as a way of um, helping to get out of the body and into, I mean, sorry, out of the mind and into the body. So I'm going to do a really uh, simple just to make people feel like um, you don't have to be an awesome artist. Oh, you can't see it because it's white. <laughs> Oh, there we go. You can see it sort of. Anyway, there's my super superhero uh, self. And we've got some empathy, love, storytelling, songwriting, thinking outside the box. Excellent one. They're all excellent, really. Connect deeply with nature and see the nature in everything. Enjoyment of nuance and by voice. Beautiful, beautiful answers. So one of the things that we do is we get kids thinking about what their superpower is. And it's, it's a way of connecting with their spirit and what they, they don't, you don't have to know what, um, what your superpower is in the moment. And the way that we call our program that, which is called the planet protector Academy, I think of it like going to, um, going to Jedi school was when I was a kid, I, saw a Star Wars and wanted to go to Jedi school and there wasn't one. I wanted to learn the force. Come on, people. So um, yeah, that's what we call our program because we really feel like every kid can be a super pair. Oh, I see Chelsea's holding up her picture. Um, awesome, beautiful. I don't know if anybody else wants to. I'd have, we can put your, um, um, I guess we'd have to stop screen sharing for everybody to show theirs. Yeah, <laughs> oh, there we go. Well done. So on the camera and hold up. Anything they've drawn, even if it's not done, then uh, that would be awesome just for a minute. And uh, Adrienne says she wants to learn the force. I see some superheroes out there, just a few. That's awesome. So uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, so maybe we can have a moment to show superhero pictures at the end. Um, so yeah, one of the things that we find with, uh, with the digital medium, especially with Zoom, if you're Zooming, that we get, everybody gets kind of stuck in this rectangle, right? And then we forget we have bodies. We forget that we have breath. We forget that we, um, that we are on the land. And so that's two questions for that we're going to be looking at today are how can we be embodied together, not just on our own, but together, despite the technology. And then how can we make digital led learning transformational? And so a lot of what I'm sharing today has been through this 10 year exploration of how to do just those things. 
So we're going to turn off the the PowerPoint and just just be here with each other. And um, oh, right, sorry, Sean, I've, my colleague Sean's got on, got on the PowerPoint for me. Um, so we've got three pieces. One is for the embodiment and being part to start with yourself as the educator or the person leading or however you want to name yourself and to remember the breath the body and the land and then to remember to play create and connect so if we start with you and this is particularly relevant if you're teaching remotely and um i'm gonna you can put it on speaker view or you can see everybody's names or however you want to do it so um, we often forget we're in bodies when we're on the screen um, but that's part of you know the zoom fatigue everybody knows about is i think particularly um, about um that forgetting we we like in if you know anything about human behavior you know that we don't stare at each other's eyes and not move but that's kind of what we feel like we have to do on on zoom right oh i i better sit here like this the whole time and just smile and look like you don't do that when you're talking with friends and people in a group you um you look around you look down you scratch your toe you know you don't you don't hold yourself like so i invite you all even a lot of you have the screen turned off and that's fine but if you do have your screen turned on i invite you to move we all feel like oh i can't stretch i can't you know my i've got this itch i can't touch my itch i can't do anything yes there you go madeline she's stretching Ooh. so and then also just to breathe like there, there's this thing called screen apnea. I don't know if you've heard about it, but actually when we're on screen, we stop breathing. So like, let's just everybody take just one breath. Like, and then try to actually like feel your feet or your butt on the chair. Or if you're standing, I see Greg standing outside. I think you're standing, Greg. Yeah, no, you're sitting outside though. Good for you being outside. I'm fake outside. Uh, <laughs> Oh, you're muted. You can say something though if you want to unmute. Oh, still not new. Oh, oh, it's a fake screen. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, he's fake too. Hilarious. Um, so yeah, so just like take a moment and feel your body. And this is something you can do on any call that you're doing. Forget whether you're educating or not. You can breathe. You can feel your feet. You can move around. You can liberate your eyes. And I, I do that in meetings. I tell people you do not have to look at the screen. And everybody's always so relieved. Like, I don't know if you saw everybody's body language who was on screen. Everybody did that. And there was just this like, oh God, okay, I don't have to hold myself like that. How could we possibly learn when we're holding ourselves so rigidly? Or how can we possibly teach? You know, another thing that a lot of people don't know is that you can turn off self-view. Do you guys all know that? And especially in Zoom, I don't know if it's in all in all the programs. If you go to the in Zoom, the three dots in the upper right hand corner. Um, of your picture, it says hide self view. And like, yeah, <laughs> Chelsea's really happy about that. So yeah, like who wants to stare at their face and think about like, oh, is my double chin showing all the time while you're talking to somebody, right? Like nobody wants that. And also there's this whole, I'm a performer that I've, I've been in a lot in movies and things. And you would not believe how great I look when the makeup and costume and hair people get to me. Like I look, I look incredible but only then, and then all the rest of the time, I'm comparing myself to that, like who needs that, right? And if you haven't had that experience yet, we're all comparing ourselves to movie stars and we don't have those makeup people and let's just stop it and turn off the bloody self view. So um, so yeah, this is, this is like a bit of liberation from the square. And uh, it's very interesting also because I have done, uh, I'm in a circle with many um, black, brown and indigenous women. And I noticed that they are all, just moving however they, however they want. I'm a mixed white presenting person. And um, so I have a little bit of that. I think it's part of where I come from, but I notice that that, is, that can be also particularly like white culture thing that we have, you know, the stiff off a lip, let's, not, let's just be like this. So there's a little bit of liberation from that constraint as well. So um, yeah, and then when we're present and we're embodied together, like if you do this when you're on a Zoom call, even with your aunt or your grandmother or something like that, then you'll you'll discover is when I'm connected with my breath and you're connected with your breath, then we can actually feel connected together. So I'd like to do a little experiment that um, anybody who's willing for a moment to turn on their camera and to turn on your, uh, to unmute yourselves. I'm not gonna have you talk. I'm just gonna have you breathe. So don't be shy, but anybody who wants to participate in this can um, turn on your camera. And if you don't, that's totally fine. 
but I would just say, because when we can hear each other a little bit, hear a little bit of sound and we can hear each other breathe and we can see each other being like, let's just see what happens. Okay. So first of all, I want, I want, let's do a box breathing where we breathe in for a count of four and I'll count us through, hold for two, out for a count of four, hold for two. We call this the superhero calming breath or the superhero calming breath as we call it. Um, so, <laughs> so we're going to do that breath just to sort of actually jiggle first. Everybody jiggle first. Yeah, just jiggle first. Okay. And if you, if you don't want to turn your camera on, you can also just turn your mic on so we can hear you breathe. So let's do that breath together and then I'll do the next step. So in for four. Hold for two. Hold for two. And then out through your mouth for four. Hold for two. Let's do that again. In for four. Hold for two, out for four. Hold for two. So that, as you may know, calms your vagus nerve, which helps calm your whole system. I'm much calmer now. And it's very useful anytime you're agitated. It helps bring you back into your body, helps get you out of your head. So now that we've breathed, I want everybody just for a moment to close your eyes and try to kind of feel each other in the space. Just like, doesn't matter, just feel, feel your body, feel the floor, feel your butt, and try to see if you can feel each other. And we got a little bit of sound to help us hear, hear the rooms that we're all in. So just for a few, like 10 seconds, let's try that and close your eyes. And now it's time to practice. This is the hero calling me red. <laughs> and now open your eyes and look at each other and just, you may not have noticed anything, that's totally fine. But if you did, you can either say it, you can also turn off your mic now, that's kind of the end of the exercise, or if you're shy or whatever, um, or you can write in the chat or you can tell us anything that you noticed about that at all. Everything, everything is right, there's no wrong answer. Nothing is also a good answer. Pippin says she's this? calm. It was really quiet, like I was marveling at how quiet everybody's houses are. And then um, there's the idea, because you told us to try to be aware of each other or try to notice each other. And so there was the intention uh, to be aware of others. And then I couldn't really feel anything, but I felt the intention to be aware of others. Um, and that in and of itself was a, a nice place to go to. Well. Cool. I'll read a couple of comments here. Adrienne says, I had a feeling I was sitting with you in your kitchen, Chelsea. And Tamiko feels more chill. You guys can read these two, I guess. Madeline says calm. Karen says she was relaxing. So I could feel this a little bit. I could feel this sort of like hesitancy of, I don't know about this. Um, and a little bit of like, wow, what nice people there are in this room. <laughs> so that was that exercise. And it's just a little um, playing with the, the feeling of, actually being energetically with each other, even though we have this distance. So, oh, hyper real serenity, ooh, very nice. And Karen says she could feel the people around me, her beautiful, beautiful. So yeah, let me just look at my notes and see if I forgot anything. Oh yeah, standing like a superhero. So we always encourage, because we work with elementary school kids, I don't think I mentioned that, but it, this works with like adults as well. We have kids stand like a superhero, and there's 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 super research on this about that that shows that when you stand in a power pose, it actually makes you feel more powerful. And that's again, yeah. Oh. Let's actually all try that. Do a superhero pose in your seat. <laughs> it's funny. It's like using your body. It like changes us. We're we're so in our culture. So this, we have this idea that we are these like heads that sort of wobble around and are disconnected from but it's so interconnected and how can learning not be 
connected to how you feel in your body and how you calm you are and and that kind of thing. So on all of these things you can do off offline. I mean, in our, we have, uh, so I didn't really describe our programs very well, but um, so we have our live shows that we did before COVID. Um, we have, then we had some from the last 10 years, the Planet Protector Academy, which is a classroom program that's entirely, it's used by the teacher, we're not there. And we were trying to figure out like, how do we get a classroom of 30 kids to be jumping up around and doing stuff and fully embodied when we're not there. So that's the Planet Protector Academy approach. Then in COVID, everything shut down. We were like, how do we get one kid and that we're live broadcasting through, through, through these home edition programs that we did in the last spring, since last spring, how do we get one kid by themselves without any friends or any team that they're in to move their body? And then now we're doing these assemblies um, that are for a whole school that, and that was even harder because now we don't have any connection with the kid at all. It's just a broadcast. So in all of these contexts, we've been trying to figure out how to transcend this digital medium in a way that isn't, you know, like all the other things that are digital for kids that it just sucks them in and keeps them on the screen. Like how do you use digital media to move kids off screen and out into their lives and doing things? So that's been our basic approach. And um, so, yeah, the body break we often put in, um, I think anybody who works with humans probably knows that we all get tired of just sitting there. So move our blood. And, you know, we, we often ask for a body break. Often the kid's favorite one is act like a monkey. So um, yeah. And then, and then with connecting with the land, it's not for me, it's not just about land recognition. It's about literally this land that we're on. So in COVID, we were really thinking about how do we connect some kids somewhere? You know, we don't know what kind of context that they're living in to the land where they can't go anywhere. Right. So how do we do that? And so we started developing exercises that would be just like, you know, go find a plant outside wherever that is, or find the local, what's the closest water to you go with your family or your brother and find the closest route. Does it have a name? And then do, do the indigenous people from this land have a name for that water as well? So there's various ways that you can go, even in the constraint of lockdown, unless you're not allowed outside your house. I don't know. Is anybody in Ontario where you're allowed outside your house again? <laughs> is anybody in Ontario are you allowed to say around that just seems so odd but anyway <clears throat> but and even even inside a home you know I was uh, an indigenous friend of mine Lila June she was saying you know this is like when I'm in deep meditation in a retreat being in lockdown so and you know she is connecting with the land through just the land under her feet that she can feel so um yeah, and I guess maybe people can turn off their mics now. I think that might be Pippa. I'm not sure. I can hear somebody tapping, <laughs> which is great. Um, okay, so that's just sort of the introduction to like how to be. Um, oh yeah, and Sean says he's gonna put up a PowerPoint to recap the first three ingredients that we talked about. Go ahead, Sean. That's my colleague, Sean. Da, da, da. There we go. So yeah, you start with you as, as the educator and your body and your breath, right? And where you are. And then remembering the breath, the body and the land. Now to play, create and connect, those are, um, that the connecting was like feeling each other. There's a, a bunch of ways that you can use, um, I guess I didn't cover that one quite enough yet. Um, um, you can, we have, team names for kids we put them in teams so they call themselves like the uh, the boulders or the tsunamis or something like this we have uh points that we use we'll get into that a bit more later of course you know you can use breakout rooms for engagement um the feeling each other in the room was part of that and we use rewards and teamwork points that kind of thing lots of play ideas that we'll come up with in, in later stuff one of the things you can do is have a theme for the day if I had a theme for today, it might be glitter. And so you could have like a background that's glittery or wear a glittery hat or paint your fingernail glittery or something like that. It's just a fun way to just, and, and even in a meeting, you can have a theme for the day. All right, I think we're over to the transformational learning piece and getting a bit more into our, from like the, the ingredients that we use in the Planet Protector Academy and our other programs to, um, engage kids in environmental learning specifically. So the, the, all that other stuff was just about like being a human online. This is more like, how do we connect this with environmental learning and what's our particular way? How do we get kids? How do we create a tra transformational space 
basically is what we were aiming at, a liminal space in which change can happen. And these are the three basic elements that we use. I do have a praxis that covers all of this. If anybody's super keen and wants to dig into a whole bunch of other research that I linked to, that Sean is going to put in the chat. But um, this is just sort of the, over, the overview. And so we have story, arts, and gamification as our three pieces. And um, so uh, the first thing that we're going to do is story. So why don't we go to story, Shan? Ah, we're going to, oh, okay, oh, yeah, story, thank you. Okay. So we are going to play. Um, that's right. I got messed up. We're going to do a game show. One of the things that we do in our program is a game show. It's one of the kids' favorites parts. So I will ask a question. You, if you are visual or not, you make a superhero pose because it helps you feel confident about answering. Very good. Very good. And then you can write an answer in chat. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, because one of the things that we do is we do, we, um, Sorry, I interrupted myself. I'm gonna ask you questions and then you answer them. And the way that we do this um, bringing in new material to kids in our programs is we don't, we kind of, it's a little bit of inquiry-based learning, I guess, and um, not the full full meal deal of inquiry-based learning, but we don't give them information and then ask them about it. We actually ask them first and then see when we tell them that it's okay to be wrong. We have characters that fail constantly in a really funny way so that you don't have to worry. Um, you can feel okay about failing. So the idea is that you try, that's why you also need the superhero pose and you guess. And then there's research that shows that as some of you know, you're nodding, uh, that when you try and give an answer and then hear the actual information, it actually has a place in your brain now to land and it's easier to remember. Um, so that's the theory. Now let us do the game show, starting with storylines and superheroes. So, the first question, are you ready with your question? Uh, with your superhero pose and then write the answer or you can just think it, whichever you like. What are the benefits of bringing story into environmental education, do you think? Could you imagine? There is no wrong answer. So I'm gonna give you a second to answer that while I go do, 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 or education more generally. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Do, 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 do. Is that really annoying? Do, 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 do. So we have lots of answers here. Um, kids connect better to story. It's a familiar format. Helps kids relate personally. Personally connect makes more relevant. Helps students remember what they're learning about. It's creativity. It's fun. We are story. Ooh. Somebody knows story connects to others. It's a fun way, way humans have learned for millennia. And it's our life story that should include the environment. Yes, this is true. So you can keep adding those and we'll say some of our answers here. It's fun and engaging, gives learning and action a purpose, it makes it more memorable and moderates behavior and leadership. So one of the things that we do is our characters model what to do and what not to do. So we have a superhero who always gets it right and her sidekick who always gets it wrong. And any anything that we want to make a child feel like doing, we have the superhero do. And every time we want to show them what not to do or how to fail willingly, we have the sidekick do that. Um, so you want to go to the next uh, slide, Sean? So we give kids a mission book and an ID card and um, we, when, so we, I didn't say this before, but as part of our program, we have all these videos with our characters. I think that's been kind of implied, but um, sidekick sounds like psychic. <laughs> I'll enunciate, enunciate better. Um, so we have these videos that with these superhero characters that are very funny and engaging for kids. They've, kids really love these characters, Esmeralda Planet Protector and her sidekick Goober. And then at a certain point, and then this is all projected at the front of the classroom for their classroom program. And at a certain point, the characters turn to the camera and say, welcome apprentices. This is the Planet Protector Academy and you are all here to learn about real life. This is real life and you all have a mission. And that's the idea of the identity-based work that we're doing so that kids feel part of the story, that they are a character in the story, that they're together 
as characters. And uh, this has been incredibly effective. We have like 73% of kids saying they feel like real life planet protectors at the end. And it's a big, big part of why we think kids go home and change their families is because they feel like they're part of this big movement of planet protectors. So, okay. Um, yeah, and being an apprentice means that you're learning, right? So, oh, somebody asked what age is grades is this program targeted to? So uh, the classroom program is about grades three to six, although it depends on your class uh, after six. It's sort of like old enough to read, young enough to still believe you could be a superhero. Once the cool factor hits in, it's, so that depends on the class when the, the where they are, the cool factor can hit in and then they feel like they're a bit too cool for all of this. And younger kids have enjoyed it though. So we've done it with um, kindergarten to grade seven and everybody enjoys it. It's just a matter of, it takes a little bit more hands-on with the younger kids kind of thing. Um, all right, so next we will go to the arts. And are you ready for the game show? The power hose pose, power hose, that was weird. Power pose. <laughs> Um, and then write the answer. Okay, here we go. Next slide. What are the benefits of using arts-based activities in environmental education or any other kind of education? So take a moment, do a power pose and uh, write your answer, what do you think? No answers are wrong. I'll just take another minute. So yes, as I as I figured, you have some good answers here. Different ways of learning and presenting. It's fun, reflection and personalization, connection and uh, expression, creativity. Helps students reflect on the beauty of nature. A good one. Expression. They're all good ones allow students to bring personal connections from their own experiences. Yes, indeed, individualized. Um, using our bodies to move the emotions and thinking outwards, nice. We cannot live without beauty in our lives and art can help us express that beauty, absolutely. Let's, you can keep writing answers and let's go over to the, to our, some of the things that we think encourages childlike content, leads to more meaningful actions engages different learning styles and elicits joy. So yeah, the learning styles piece is very, um, very helpful. The, the, using our three met, our arts, um, games and story really engages all kids. It's one of the things we hear from teachers a lot is that, oh, this is the one thing that all of my very diverse kids in terms of neurodiversity and behavioral diversity and all those kinds of, that they all are really, really engaged in this because of these things that art is something that transcends language as well often, right? especially visual art. We do um, all sorts of different kinds of art as well. We have kids write raps. We have, which, you know, often a, a kindergarten teacher will say, will say, or a grade one teacher will say, you know, my children can't write a rap. Well, they, they can't write a good one. <laughs> they can't, you know, like it's, it's gonna suck, like honestly, right? <laughs> but, uh, but it's amazing, like how kids will, you know, even the youngest kids who can't even, can't even write yet will, you know, make up words and, and say them and stuff. So, yeah. Um, what are some other things? Yeah, and one of the things about art is that it it's in their imagination, it, um, when you connect your imagination to the work that you're doing, the environmental learning or whatever, it's like the child's spirit or soul is connected now to the work, right? Art is about your spirit. It's about, and whatever, you don't have to be religious, it's to be your, your, your inner self or your essence or, whatever word you want to use, but that individual flame that each person has, it connects you to that, to that in a way. And, and that's part of the transformational piece is when I'm connected and now I feel like I'm part of the story that is just gonna make a big change in me and how I feel in relating to, to everything that I do. We have an example that we can give of how kids uh, in one of our uh, program, one of our programs, um, explore active transportation. So that's in our climate program. So first we have a group drawing exercise of draw, draw different kinds of transportation methods. And then we have them rate them by what they think is the most polluting to the least polluting. And they 
draw like so they've got this big piece of paper and they're all drawing together well this was before covid <laughs> they have to do it individually now um but it, it's the concept i'm trying to get across so and then um then they together as a as a group they brainstorm the barriers to using more active modes of transportation and then they brainstorm solutions so like what is stopping you from walking to school as a family oh it's too far or it's cold or my parents don't want to or whatever and then we brainstorm solutions with them and then we give them the assignment of creating a skit where some of them are kids and some of them are parents and their job is to convince their parents to change that and to walk to school with them. Um, and then we give them the mission to go and convince their parents to, um, to uh, walk to school. And so it's like this way of using art to go through the journey of the barrier and engaging with the barrier. Okay. Um, and it's also just art is awesome. And then we're back to, we're at gamification. Oh, I just want to, um, to see in the chat. Some of the most popular music is super simple. Yes, that is part of my, my uh, success with writing songs that stick in your head is that to keep them simple. Okay, now we're on gamification, the last of the three. And yay, I see Chelsea standing up. Go Chelsea. Okay. Um, <laughs> So we're our last uh, game, game show question is on gamification. Are you ready? Superhero pose. And what are the benefits of using gamification in environmental or other education? All right, let's see what we got. We have kids love gaming. Uh, it's engaging for kids, encourages engagement, problem solving, helps current kids learn quickly and automatically, uses critical thinking skills, captures attention and funnels energy, capitalizing on intrinsic motivation, yes. Stimulate excitement, heart racing, desire for speed, challenge, possibility of many, many failures and always more chances. Yeah, so you guys understand. So let's go to the next slide, Sean. Um, so yeah, the all the things that you said, one of the things that we found is that teachers often, we have a scoreboard in our program and teachers often discover how good it is. Oh, if you, you know, we, we, get, we give a point for your team every time you bring back your mission book signed and then teachers start to use that <laughs> all the time. Um, and uh, when we say scaffolds, more complex actions in the example that I gave with the um, drawing a picture of transportation stuff, you get points all along the journey. And so you can, um, similarly, you can, if you get, if we give a kids a, a difficult assigned mission to take home, which they have every week, they have a mission to take home. Like um, if it's more complicated, like, composting it's got a bunch of steps there so you get a point for doing each step and it helps kids navigate those different steps because they want each of the points um gamification is a really interesting thing because when we first started uh, we found kids were excluding each other and when we were doing the experimentation in our first two years and teachers told us to include teamwork points in order to win so as soon as we changed that that you had to have teamwork points to win it was amazing we were suddenly gamifying inclusion um and it's it even works with adults we did it at a conference once we gave people points for bring, bringing other people at a conference to um the photo booth and that made the very 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 competitive adults bring in every other person they possibly could to be included in this activity so that was really interesting all right so um moving on there's our scoreboard oh and here's the scaffolding actions that's what our scoreboard looks like on on uh, the platform site um, so yeah, in the program itself, in the missions, we also scaffold the um, the difficulty. So we start with something easy that has no sacrifice and for the missions and minimal effort. And then we move on to something that's a little bit harder. Um, so sorry, so the first one at the bottom <clears throat> green, looking for opportunities, that's like, just look around at your house. That's an easy one, no, no sacrifice. And then um, we ask them to look at their food waste and do an eat me first um, box in their fridge 
that doesn't take very much effort, but and it's helpful, it saves you money. So it's got benefits with very little sacrifice. And then we go to organics recycling, which has some sacrifice, but there's a lot more effort required, especially if you don't have a pickup. And then with the waste-free lunch, well, now I'm not buying my favorite, whatever it is that's packaged and easy, and that's a bit higher. So we, we scaffold them in that, in that direction as well. And on to the next. Um, oh yeah, so our programs are, we, we're a charity and we make sure that our programs are free because we believe in access and equity. And so we have an on-demand classroom resource and we have a live stream broadcast that's after school starting May 4th that's um, for individual kids at home. So if you have home learners or just any kids that you know who are looking for something to do um, after school, we have one on May 4th. The on-demand uh, classroom program is free. We have one on, uh, if you want to show the next slide, Sean, we have ones on climate. Cleat Cool is the one on climate. Zero Heroes is on zero waste. H2O is on water and emergency preparedness squad. And actually, I didn't say this, but we have partnered with, uh, we actually were invited by an indigenous nonprofit in Alberta to create an indigenous superhero kid. And, oh, sorry, 4.30 P. Pacific, so 7.30 Eastern. Um, sorry, I'm interrupting myself. We were invited by an indigenous nonprofit to create a Cree superhero kid and integrate indigenous wisdom and knowledge into our program. So we have a series made by indigenous artists called Messages from Mother Earth that is in each of the programs. And I, um, Sean will be sending the link to all of that. Oh, you already did, thinking ahead of me. Um, and that's been a really exciting project to include in the program. And uh, so, yeah, the classroom resources can be used on demand. The hot live stream edition, uh, home edition is at uh, 4.30 on, I'm not sure which day, but that would be in the program. And, uh, oh, May 4th to June 8th, Sean said. So that's one day a week, every Tuesday. Thank you. Um, and we're also running assemblies for schools. So I, I, uh, in certain areas, we have funding that for school-wide assemblies that have been really fun for half an hour. They're just half an hour show. And then here's where you can contact us and Sean will be giving you a lot more links. Um, we're happy to take any questions now. You can write them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. But if you wanna go, that's cool. And thank you very much for uh, listening. I really, really hope that this is beneficial to you and that you can um, use some of what we said. Again, if you want to dig in more, you can either um, sign up for our programs or you can uh, read our, our um, practice document. And yeah, so if anyone has any questions. Just pop on for a quick second here, if you don't mind, Vanessa, just sure. to thank you and and Sean for this session. And uh, just on behalf of Ken Learn and all the sponsors, uh, thanks for making uh, this available to us. It's uh, been great and we've loved learning about uh, the stuff that you do and look forward to taking advantage of it as well. So thank you very much. Thanks, thanks so much. Really glad to be here. Vanessa, I just wanted to ask you kind of how you, like where the past came from that you're on now, if you can think of, you know, how you got your direction or your inspiration or? <laughs> um, well, for me, I, when I was in my early twenties, I went to, uh, ended up randomly um, in Tofino on the West coast of Vancouver Island and nobody had ever heard of it. I'd never heard of it. And I had this amazing place in, with a, um, I was a singer songwriter, musical theater performer, and I was living in the rainforest, like out my backyard and my landlady clear cut the, uh, my backyard, which had been with like ancient rainforest and cougars and, and things. And then it was it turned into a parking lot. And I joined the Clackwit, um, the Friends of Clackwit Sound, which were trying to protect the forest in the region. There were like eight of us. And I wrote songs <laughs> for uh, for us as we, and I organized and, you know, it was just 10 of us or so at the beginning. And then it grew to like 8,000 a couple of years later. And um, but all the way through, I was like writing songs and of all the organizing and planning work that I did, the writing songs with a thing that really was like mine that really did made a difference for people's and it kept them going and re-energized them and gave them something to sing together and all this kind of thing. And um, it was a, a fluke that we worked with the city of Vancouver answered an ad, but not a fluke that we continued. I mean, um, we, uh, 
made this, there was an engineer who'd gone to theater school and they had a bit of budget in the water department. So he asked us to write a play about, uh, a play for young kids. And then it just kind of built from that word of mouth, it grew and grew and grew and, and then sort of gradual experimentation and iteration and, you know, listening to my intuition and going out on the land and asking what to do kind of thing <laughs> and listening for the answer. So thank you. Yeah, I don't know if there are any other questions. There don't seem to be many, but I'm happy to hang around for a minute if there are. Thank you very much. It was a beautiful session. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Really, really appreciate your time with us.